went in, uh, I was, all of them were Vietnamese on the plane, and uh, I was arrested for, and interrogated for three days and nights. And the Vietnamese remembered that, and, and they've come up many times later and apologized. They, the Vietnamese and I are really, really good friends. And so we, uh, I worked there, and then I went back to, to Indonesia, and there was this guy lying in bed. And I noticed the whole ward was this. And he had had, they showed me his x-ray, as a fracture of his distal femur. And I, he had been there three years. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I said, we talked about this. And uh, we, we determined that, that we could treat these. But what he said was, the patient can't afford an implant. And the second thing that he said was, uh, and even if he could, we get donations from the United States and we can't use them. We have power surges here and therefore we can't use any power equipment. And that was a sentinel of that. And I realized that I would wasted 10 years. We had concentrated on the surgeons and education when I should have been looking at the results of the education. It was a big mistake. I so we, we went back and we started thinking about how can we help. I, I have some slides of traffic uh, in Bangladesh and all over. It's horrible. If you think but Seattle traffic is bad, you should see traffic in Bangladesh or Vietnam. In Vietnam, it's like herds of fish, schools of fish. Uh, you, you just you have to go slowly across the street. I, I remember being afraid to go across the street and I saw this lady with a big stick going across, and she was blind. So that put me in my place. <laughs> so that was in Hanoi. <clears throat> and uh, it's a horrible problem, and it's an economic problem. One of the reasons it's a horrible problem is the $500 motorcycle. Poverty is decreasing throughout the world. There's only now one billion people that make less than a dollar a day. It used to be uh, four billion. And, and, and now one billion makes ten dollars a day, et cetera. But they can afford a $500 motorcycle. They buy it on time or they buy it rented. And it becomes the family vehicle. And it clogs up the highways. So the rate of traffic accidents is increasing spontaneously and high. It's a merging epidemic. And so it kills more people and disables more people than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. I would like to have just 15 minutes with Bill Gates because this, that's an important issue. And what it does, according to WHO statistics, uh, if it's a wage earner, you, a parent, and these are the ones out on the motorcycle going to work, uh, the whole family spirals into poverty if that parent is disabled for three generations. That's a huge number of people. So one fracture treated to avoid disability does a lot of good. So uh, that's the problem. The other problem is the hospital circumstances. They cannot take an increased influx of patients. The patients are piling up in the emergency room. And uh, you can't even get in between the patients in, in, in Black Lion Hospital in Ethiopia. I had a picture of that. And then you look at uh, the wards. When I was in uh, the Philippines and Cambodia about four months ago, and the wards are filled. I mean, uh, there's hardly room to get in between the beds. They're all waiting for surgery. And what happens? The surgery lasts longer because the, the fractures are four to six weeks old by the time they get into surgery. So it's a big problem. It's a big problem. The hospital, and they're, they're government hospitals, so they don't work any faster, unfortunately. And uh, so then uh, we have the situation of what to do. It's a problem. Conflict makes it worse. Uh, we're in all the conflict areas. We're in Syria. Uh, I, I went to Gaziantep, Turkey, to train 
the Syrian doctors, and one fella uh, walked all the way from Damascus to this conference so he could help his people. And uh, so he told me this, and he, he told me that he had treated the people who uh, had uh, were gassed, and the gas came off the people's clothes. He fainted, uh, did more than faint, uh, they gave him atropine. He came to consciousness, and he was blind for two weeks. He walked from Damascus. One of his uh, compatriots stepped on a mine and was killed. And this is the kind of ded dedication these doctors have. I, I was a, uh, just amazed. I was just in Afghanistan uh, two to three weeks ago. And uh, they, those doctors there are, you think it's hard as a resident, but those doctors there are trying to live a normal family life. They are trying to uh, uh, practice good medicine. The only implants they have of, of any quality are the sign implants because the implants from other areas around are poor quality and they break. And, and I'm committed now uh, to uh, branching out uh, to pelvic fractures and spinal injuries because these need, need help. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we design Hey, hey, hey. Thanks. You're welcome. I'll go through this quickly, and I, I appreciate, I'm, I apologize for this. This is our vision statement. We've had this vision statement since we started. This is a video that's supposed to start, but we won't go. This is what I was talking about as emotion. It's, it's like a big bubble. Uh, that, that, that all of a sudden uh, comes to fruition or ex it explodes. And this is what the, can we turn down the lights? Yep, right there, that switch right there. Thanks, Ray. Uh, this is what it looks like. There, there's no one there. We went out in MedCab there and to try to take care of the people. And I decided that we, we, were, we couldn't do that very well, so I, I took over an orphanage. And uh, my wife is a pediatrician, and all I did was public health. Uh, and uh, hi. Hey, hey. So we just, uh, this is our second start. <laughs> and this is the man who's lying in bed for three years. And uh, Okay, what I was going to say is that, uh, for those of you who just walked in, uh, is that we all have sentinel events. The first sentinel event was in Vietnam. The second sec sentinel event uh, was in Indonesia. This is, the, this is the situation in Bangladesh. I, I've uh, traveled back and forth with that rickshaw driver uh, to the hospital. And this is a family, this is Afghanistan. Uh, this is a family uh, that spirals into poverty if the patient uh, is disabled. The father, or more importantly, the mother. And these are the kids, these are rickshaw drivers. And they're just, they, they're out of school, they're so eager to learn, it's just so sad. And this is the um, emergency room. I had mentioned that we have a big problem in the hospitals because the hospitals are backing up. The patients are waiting in the emergency room for two or three weeks trying to, to get a place in the hospital. And when they do get in, look at how crowded they are. They're all waiting for surgery. And this is an epidemic all over the world. So we, in order to help uh, this problem, we must design implants that can be used in developing countries. We must manufacture them, which we do in the Tri-Cities. We donate them for the poor, but we evaluate them. We, uh, when a sign surgery is done, it has to be reported back to the database with x-rays, and uh, we've learned so much. Our database has 95,000 uh, 
patients now. We've done 155,000 surgeries around the world. And we're looking for collaboration. It's, it's very important that we collaborate so we can move into those other complex fractures. Power surges means no power equipment. It's quickly destroyed. And so we have substituted tactile sense. I have a feel like I have a better feeling, and I'll race anybody in the United States for finding the distal interlock uh, without a C-arm. They can use a C-arm, or they can use that Smith and Nephew thing. <laughs> I challenged, I was going to challenge Paul Tornetta, but they said I shouldn't. So. It's a solid nail. Uh, this is the nail up here. And we'll see it. There's less deflection. Every, and I, I am uh, very humble about this. We have, we, we could get solid bar stock, and that's why we got a solid nail. There's less infection. There's less place for biofilm to form. It's stronger so we can use slots instead of holes, and therefore it dynamizes. Our fractures heal uh, quicker. There's no arc of radius, and if you take a piece of PVC pipe and bend the pipe, create a fracture, put, a, put an arc of radius nail, that's a curved nail, and put a straight nail in, the straight nail is much stronger, much, much more stable fixation. The construct is stronger. These are our reamers. They're, they are uh, hand reamers. We started off with, we start off with a, a, a pointed reamer, and then we use a uh, reamer which has a blunt tip. And the reason for that is that we started in Vietnam, where the, the, the bone was very soft. And we used hand drills, and it worked very well. And then we moved to Bangladesh and some other places where it's really hard, so we had to modify. But we use hand reamers, and I have a video of what happens inside the canal. It doesn't ream circumferentially like a power reamer does, and so it, it fits the nail better, and it doesn't take away the, the blood supply as much in a circumferential. We started off doing the tibia, femur, humerus. We do uh, uh, ankle fusions now, retrocalcaneal, and knee fusions. And the sign surgeons, I give them all the credit. They, they have taken our nail and just taken it to different uh, bones and for different uh, uses. This is a, a segmental fracture of the tibia. We can treat a patient uh, by closed reduction if we can get them within 10 days. And uh, we routinely uh, do that. Again, we're talking about tactile signs. This young girl came in uh, when I was in Vietnam, and uh, we were just treating the tibia. This is too high, and this is in uh, the, the wrong way. But this is the first one we did. And uh, so we, we, she was in the supine position, and we thought we would put her up the, the nights. This was in 1999. Uh, Dr. Swinkowski had written about retro retrograde approach using coming in from the side. And uh, there was, in retrospect, there's a few studies out. And then they sent me this picture it was before the internet was available in Vietnam, and she's standing on that leg uh, at six weeks. And this one case doesn't mean it'll work, but it sure did give us a lot of uh, encouragement at, at the time. This is... Uh, my soulmate, Dr. Han Koi Kwong, uh, again from Vietnam. And uh, so he, he wrote me, in, and these are letters going back and forth. He wrote me and said, we put the sign nail in uh, through anti-grade, through the top. And uh, I said, oh, we're going to have to change the, the, uh, the anatomy of the nail. They were just developing uh, some of the new the new nails that, that you see at PFN and uh, other nails. And you can see the residual of K-nail thinking, coaching out of the supply flow. And, uh, but he said something very uh, prophetic to me. He said, no, you don't have to change uh, the anatomy. You don't have to make it look like the gamma nail, which they were developing. What you do is when you come to this proximal 
uh, then just let it rotate as it goes in. Don't try to force it. And if you take a saw bones and force it, you'll see there's a lot of hoop stresses up here. And I think this is why there have been studies showing CT scan before uh, of the femoral neck for a shaft fracture, CT scan after there's a fracture. I think they're iatrogenic. And this is a helix, this part here, and he recognized that and, it, and, and it put it in. And you can, this interlock, he, he goes from posterior to anterior, but anterior to posterior or lateral up into the head, uh, any of those, they're equally stable. In fact, I think going through two cortices might be, might be a stronger fixation. Uh, it's economical this way. You don't have to have lefts and rights. And we're donating, so. Uh, so we started analyzing the, the canal around the world. Uh, these are the Vietnamese canals. These are Bangladesh. We've got 10 of each. We've got CT scans, use materialized software to take all the measurements. And uh, this is my femur. And you can see what happened if you didn't ream. I would end up with an 8 millimeter nail. So we, we found that there's remarkable similarity uh, in the anatomy of the canals, but there's a big difference in density of the bone. We also found that a straight nail fits. And if there's a, a fracture in here, of course, uh, it can adjust uh, through the fracture. And uh, so we, we became convinced that the straight nail was a good nail. These are our innovators. There's, uh, 5,000 sign surgeons around the world. We're all a big family, and we all work together. And I probably get 40 emails a day when we're talking about fractures, and we talk about different ways to, to use the sign out and different problems. We, we bring along the, the, the new surgeons, and uh, it, it's really uh, fun. We believe that the uh, surgeon is part of our system. And therefore, when something do doesn't, goes wrong, you don't blame the nurse or blame someone else. It's you. We also believe in active participation. We believe that if there's an omission or anything that happens during the surgery, the omission is everybody's fault. And we, we have that uh, culture of sign, which is uh, so we all learn from every case. Okay, so I've talked about tibia, retrograde femur, anti-grade femur, and the humor started in India because in, in India they eat with their hands and need, need a, uh, a good base. And uh, this patient had had four uh, operations before, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in studying. Look how far that nail goes down, yet look at his flexion. There, there's, uh, we're looking at the anatomy of the distal humerus and finding actually that our thin nail fits right in there very well. We're FDA cleared, and this is this is uh, gives us credibility. But I can tell you, it probably adds 40 percent to our design time because our engineers spend that much time filling out papers, and it's interesting. We're in areas of conflict. Uh, I was, in the, uh, I was in Afghanistan in 208 uh, when there was a, uh, a, a bomb went off. Those terrorist uh, car bombs are really loud. And uh, I rushed to the hospital and I saw uh, these street cleaners down there. Nine of them had been killed in this and I thought how unfair. Here they are out trying to earn a living for their family and they're killed by someone they don't even know. It's just, it's just so wrong. They don't especially like Americans there, although we're, uh, I was just there two weeks ago and they seem to like us better. Uh, all of these are, are Afghan men and they can stare a hole in you. They, Different societies have different ways of looking at you. The Vietnamese never look you in the eye when you're traveling, but the Bangladeshis and the uh, Afghans do. And so I, well, yeah, I wanted to 
some of them. This is a, a surgeon uh, from Syria. Uh, we're, we're there, I, I mentioned earlier about how they had walked all the way to Gaziantep so I could teach them sign technique. Uh, this is our, our hospital, Aleppo, got a barrel bomb, and uh, you can see the, the despair. We're also in, uh, oh, what I was going to say, these, these men, um, there was a little old man that fell in the well, uh, and uh, that he, he was pushed to the side. These men, when we came, there was a fight in front of the hospital. They didn't want us to go in. And we, we did go in, and we had to go by them every day. And uh, so, we uh, operate on this, this little man fell in the well, he got fractured dislocations of his ankle and, and his uh, calcaneus. And I said, he had been told to have a, an amputation and he refused because he didn't have, he knew that there was no prosthesis available. Uh, I operated on him and uh, uh, he did well. And, and as I was walking out, I, I caught, the eye of these two, that we looked each other in the eye. And I thought, that's the beginning of peace. When two human beings can look at each other and recognize each other as humans. And uh, so we do, we, we're, we go into these areas, try to help. And disasters, it's the same thing. Uh, this is the tsunami. Uh, you can see that that uh, would cause different injuries. This is Pakistan with all these stone here. Nine o'clock in the morning, a lot of schools fell. And this is Haiti. Uh, people were afraid to go uh, back in a building. I would make rounds there and I say, we have to go in to fix your femur. Uh, but as soon as you can walk on crutches, you can come out here to the hill again. And everyone walked right after surgery. <laughs> they walked out. So. And so our idea of, um, of disaster response is changing. Our idea of that. Uh, this is in Nepal uh, recently, uh, about six months ago. Uh, and 99% of earthquake survivors were, was treated by sign surgeons. They didn't need any extra help. And I think that disaster response should be by going to areas of the world where they it look like they're earthquake prone, teaching the doctors how to take care of trauma and supplying them with implants. And this has worked in, in Nepal, it worked in the typhoons in the Philippines. Uh, not one infection came out of this tent. This was tent was supplied by the Canadian Army. The US Army didn't respond except in uh, rescue efforts. There's a lot of malunions around the world. We've developed a, a way uh, using these clamps. We've s s revised it to, 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 to bring it out slowly, stretch the tissues out. This is an earlier model. Uh, we, we used it in Pakistan. And we use clamps so you don't put chance pins across. You can put the nail uh, right in. And now we've uh, changed that distractor. Uh, you can use shan spins if you're doing a uh, tibia plateau fracture or something where you just need distraction and not put in a nail. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we use carpenter drills. Uh, we can't afford the other drills. We use the hacksaws too. And uh, so we have a drill cover now. This is in Afghanistan. We have a drill cover and a chuck extension, and so we can use a carpenter drill. And they work very well. The only problem is you can't put the drill bit as far up, and so it, it wobbles a little bit. This is our drill cover, and this is the chuck extension. We're modifying this now. We use a quick release, so it's easy to get on and uh, quickly to use. Uh, I mentioned earlier about sentinel events. Uh, another one that came up, uh, was when I hung up a reamer uh, in Bangladesh. I went there from uh, Vietnam uh, to Bangladesh, and uh, 
I, the reamer wouldn't go in and, and wouldn't go out. It got stuck. And we were trying to get the, one more case done before I left on the airplane. Um, we were, uh, it was a very frustrating time. We were trying to use hand drills. I didn't realize the difference in bone density around the world. And uh, they kept skiving off and very frustrating. And then hung up this reamer. And I came home, uh, I didn't make the plane, I came home very frustrated. And uh, I, I, I ride my bicycle back and forth to work. And uh, one day it occurred to me, boy, if we could put those reamer tips reamer flutes on the end of a nail, then we wouldn't have to do the distal interlock and uh, uh, it would give good stability. So we, we did this, we made our fin nail, uh, and you might say, how does it work? Why is it stable? It's because it's, again, three-point fixation, uh, a straight nail and a curved shaft, a, a curved canal, and it, it drives the fin into the canal. Now, this is theoretical, but it's, it's true on the diagram, but then some surgeons from Boston and Canada, uh, independent surgeons, uh, had a, a, a computerized way of measuring uh, stability of fractures, because I wanted to see if these fractures lost their uh, stability as time went on. Uh, they didn't. They, they held just as well as any other nail, uh, except in common rooted fractures. So I believe uh, strongly, and I don't, th that for retrograde approach, the fin nail, and I have a sample here, uh, the fin nail works very well. And it doesn't end up in the uh, high stress area, the part below the lesser trochanter for four centimeters, uh, and could cause a fracture where you put the school hole in. Uh, th that's a stress concentrator, even if you fill it with a screw. And our screws are, you'll see, are, uh, fill the hole better because they're of their configuration. I asked them to do it in stable fractures, but the sign surgeons gradually be began doing it in unstable fractures, and, the, and they healed well. And so this is how we can go ahead. We, we work with each other uh, and do, do things. And they, they have less restrictions than, than we do here. This is our squat and smile picture, and this is very important to us because we're, we've studied the x-rays and compared them with the squat and smile. Uh, this is the squat. The smile just to make it sociably acceptable. You, know, you don't want to say you got a squat picture. So it's, it's socially acceptable, but it, it shows uh, strength of the quad a range of motion of the knee, as well as the fracture healing. And it's more, I have a, a, a lot of series where they look like nine unions at four months, at six months. But we've waited if they can squat and smile, and very few of them have not healed. So we're studying this, we probably have about 3,000 to, to study, uh, and we just haven't, I haven't had the time. And, you can you can use a fin nail in the in the tibia, and you can use the fin nail in the humerus. Uh, we're also studying the distal uh, femur, distal humerus. We also have the fin nail. We uh, uh, you can see the fin here and the pediatric nail. We found that a four millimeter uh, shaft is about the biggest you can take. Uh, and by the way, Greg Schmalley has been very helpful for us as we've developed this nail. Currently, uh, well, actually about a year ago, I saw a bunch of sheep going down the street in uh, Ethiopia, and I thought, and I was thinking about how can we immobilize the distal femur? It's, it's difficult because of the distal femoral epiphysis. And uh, I don't have it in this picture, I don't think. Oh, yeah, more distal. And they're still using our regular nail with a, you can see that's really, you wouldn't th think that would work. So we're, 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 we want to see now in the middle of this uh, epiphysis if you can put uh, a nail through there and still and not affect the epiphysis. Orthopedic surgeons are beginning to uh, invade that distal femoral epiphysis with ACL reconstructions and stuff. 
And uh, we did uh, four sheep in Ethiopia, and they worked. Uh, we did the, the uh, pathological study and x-rays, and we, we want to work. And, and some of the surgeons, against my advice, uh, five of them in Mongolia uh, have put it up through there, and I, I kind of threatened them that, that they better uh, send a follow-up. Uh, at, at, uh, Greg has helped us with this, and at Case Western Reserve, they're doing this, they're studying this uh, 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 more extensively. This is this is this was an interesting time. We went to a German veterinarian, very German, and uh, did these with sheep. A four-month-old sheep is the same uh, age, uh, same age epiphysis as an adolescent uh, distal femoral epiphysis. In Afghanistan again, uh, Afghanistan's on my mind. I just got back two weeks ago. And we saw this fe fella and, and more, they're treated, uh, fractured hips are treated with traction and uh, for three weeks and then a, 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 a spike of cast. And I thought this was really cruel. It's really cold there. And nobody gets heat, nobody gets power more than six hours a day except the U.S. Army when we were there. And uh, they still don't. And, that, and to be in a body cast, in, anyway. So we wanted to treat all hip fractures. We wanted to treat all of them. Uh, stable ones, unstable ones, no matter what classification you use. Subtrochanteric fractures. Uh, Sean has done some good work on that. And uh, we, we use all your all oh, your studies and think about them. So we wanted to use a system that would treat all of these. It's just being reviewed now. And we wanted to, to do bench tests. We did bench testing for three years. And this, uh, we, we used the most unstable situation, fracture here and fracture here. Uh, David Shear, you may remember him, uh, was a trauma fellow last year here. Uh, he came by, he, li he lives in uh, Toppenish, or did, and uh, he and, and another a student, an a engineer who wanted to go to medical school, made this thing which uh, goes back and forth, uh, and gra we gradually increase the pressure uh, to see what fatigue does uh, to an implant stability. And our, our, it held up very well. So we came up with this idea of uh, a nail. Uh, we, we took one of the uh, interlocking holes out and the reason that we did is we didn't have enough room in the neck in a, in a, a patient from our patients from Asia. Uh, these are extra, extra big and these are our regular configuration of our screws but they're compression screws. They compress for th three uh, millimeters uh, and, we, and I feel like if you can compress the fracture early uh, it's good. So we went back to Afghanistan to do this one. This doesn't show up very well. And here he is. We get everybody up the day after surgery uh, and have them walk. I, I believe auto protection uh, works and uh, uh, you know we tell them to bear weight as they can. We don't have physical therapists. This is his brothers. I'll help him out. I mentioned that every uh, sign surgeon, surgery is uh, placed on the database. We have the data about it, and we have x-rays, and we now have 43% follow-up this year. will be close to 50%. So we're learning more and more, uh, and we have the power of 95,000 uh, patients and increasing. I review each one, and uh, now we can say something about fracture principles. Uh, we're using our HV plate now, which is an unusual looking plate for uh, subtrochanteric fractures, and it's holding really well. We, 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 you've got a ream and you've got to put the nail in with the fracture reduced, and then, uh, then you put the HV plate on. And I, I was in Barcelona and I saw this cathedral uh, there and how it was held by helical, helical uh, and so we try to use a helical configuration. This is a subtrochanteric fraction. 
Uh, th there's just there are different forces on this fracture, and we have to counteract these forces. And this is our HB plate. You can it's it uh, articulates with the interlocking screws and bypasses the fracture. Uh, I just saw a large uh, series of these which have done very well. We do also believe, we don't believe in the superpatellar pounds, we don't have CT scans, uh, and I feel that if you use a figure four position and push on the proximal fragment, what we forget sometimes is push back here and displace the fracture, uh, and uh, the, the ream or the nail goes out the back. Can't do that. Uh, non unions, first of all, you have to diagnose a non union. I mentioned this previously. Uh, this is at four months and it looks like a non union. This is at eight months. It looks even worse. But he can squat and smile. And this is at 12 months and you can see he's, he's not completely healed, but he's filled in a lot more. And we, we want to study this more. We believe that the squat and smile uh, uh, picture is very good. Another thing that's happened is uh, we're using uh, much more retrocalcaneal nail fusions, using our nail for that. Same nail, same instruments, and we, we, we run it up the, uh, through the retrocalcaneal nail area. This is an open fracture treated with uh, external fixation to get the wound healed. Then uh, small fragment here be hard to hold. You could probably use an Elizaroth there. It's a segmental uh, fracture. So he's treated with um, retrocalcaneal. He healed the fracture. He fused the ankle. And I don't understand this, but they told me that he doesn't need to have rocker bottom shoes. Uh, but I, I think he should. I, I wear them myself. So, uh, there's a lot of issues with fracture healing. And I, I really like these mind maps. If you want to learn a, a different way to learn a subject, make a mind map instead of a bunch of, of bullets. And we have to realize we can't control any of these red arrows. We can't control the fracture, the injury, the blue arrow. We have to recognize that we don't always get operating time available, what implants are available, what equipment's available. And we can control uh, those. And we, uh, so we have to be respectful of uh, each injury and how it's healed. And we can't be like the rooster. The rooster gets up in the morning and crows and the sun comes up. So the rooster thinks he brings the sun up. But there's other factors there, as you know. And so we have to avoid that tendency. We have to ask questions. We ask a lot of questions at sign. We try to understand how things work, and we're, we're very humble about uh, the role that we can play. Tolstoy says you have to hoe your patch. Uh, we all have a patch to hoe. All of you are studying and have studied to be orthopedic surgeons. Our patch is, is taking care of fractures. This is uh, Colonel Wardock in Afghanistan. And we've 155,000 uh, patients have been treated. We're very happy, but I'm not satisfied. There's a lot in the surrounding patch. Different injuries and more and more long bone fractures because of the increasing numbers of road traffic accidents. So I hope you will contemplate with me about how we can help this increased number of patients. Uh, this, is, this is in the Gobi Desert. And when you want to contemplate, it's nice to go away and get away from everything. I, 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 I worked in Ulaanbaatar for a while, and then I went out in the Gobi Desert. And it was, it was a he healing time for me. We believe in failing fast. We, don't, we want you to make mistakes and so we can learn from them. And we also believe that a surgeon is skillful in proportion to the equipment uh, he can do without, he or she can do without. And uh, I think this is, uh, I just made this up, but I think it's, so. well, thank you, but I want to tell you about these three women, these three. Um, 
they're Maasai women. And I go uh, almost every year to uh, northern Tanzania, to Arusha, where the Maasai tribe is. And the surgeon there is, goes out and finds the difficult cases that we can operate on. It's, it's a wonderful place because the anesthesiologist, anesthetist works hard, the nurses work hard. It's a very favorable, we can operate 12 hours a day. And these three women all had fractured femurs. And one of them for five years, one of them four years, and one of them three and a half years. And they did not seek medical care. They couldn't afford it. Uh, and, uh, or they were told nothing could be done. There, uh, so we operated on those three women, uh, and you can see uh, uh, they've done well. And, and that's the joy of sign. It's, a lot of times it's the agony and the ecstasy uh, because things are difficult, but this is the excess, as you can see, part of it. And we, we treat a lot of kids, and of course kids uh, can make you smile no matter what. Okay, that's all I have. I, I apologize for the USB but not working. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Greg. Um, thank you for the great talk. Sure. I know that as we go on, we'll have more questions later, but we have the lab set up next door, okay. so we can just go and ask while we're doing that. And then that's fine. That's fine. And put the reamers in for me, so we'll have to work this out.